All righty, so let's get going. Um, this is, uh, I just said just a second ago, workloads are matter. And we've had a lot of talk today about infrastructure, infrastructure management. I think the last session was very interesting about NFV, a very specific workload, or a very specific use case. But now we're going to talk about um, sort of more general data processing infrastructure and application deployment frameworks. So in this session, we're going to be talking about Hadoop and Cloud Foundry, so as the leading paths uh, for OpenStack. Um, and as ever, it's going to be a, a, a session packed full of demos, right? We like to fly um, dangerously, live dangerously, so Samuel's going to give us some more demos. So we're going to start with Samuel, then we'll be passing over to Dustin and Compil, uh, and then finishing on a high with Pivotal. So thanks. OK, we made that choice to talk about big data today because while it's a, it's a pretty new technology and it's like a bit like teenage sex. So everybody talks about it and nobody actually does it. So that's what we want to fix. We want to make things that are very, very complex, very simple for people to use, to consume, so that in a sense they can still talk about it, but then they can actually do it as well. What we're going to do is try to find a news uh, that is related to big data and see what we can do with it and how we can transform that news into an actual workload and deploy it in minutes with Juju. So if you remember about five days ago, IBM and Twitter announced they signed a partnership to make tweets available for, uh, to companies. It's not only tweets, it's the information you can collect from tweets and then you make that valuable uh, data-driven dis um, data decision making. So. If you look at that and you say, okay, uh, what should I do if I want to do it for myself? What is involved in actually taking tweets, analyzing them, and turning that into data-driven decisions? First of all, we're going to look at what it represents. So in that news, uh, and that's also what Twitter advertises on Wikipedia, they said they had half a billion tweets a day. So that's about 6,000 tweets per second. One tweet you collect from the streaming API from Twitter is about three kilobytes. So that's about 140 megabits per second of bandwidth, which turns out into 600 terabytes of raw data per year. So if you want to store that and have a replication of three, for example, it's about two petabytes per year. So that is big data, okay? You can't feed that on a single machine and you can't also process it with a single machine. So you need that big data tools to fix that. Now, what we're going to do is have a look at how, what are the technologies available to fix my problem, which is analyzing tweets, store them, and provide valuable information. And when I look at that, I've got so many technologies that I have a headache already. And that's one of the big problems of big data. It's like there are so many solutions that they are, they are actual problems, okay? There's no problem to fix. But there are uh, shortcuts for this. So in our example, what we want to do is get the Twitter feed, push that to a big fat storage system, analyze it in real time, and then present it to users. We can use that set of technologies here. So you see five boxes. Kafka is um, push-pull, uh, um, sorry, sorry, um, messaging system. So it moves data from Twitter to your workload. Adoop, I don't have to present it. It's, uh, it's kind of the canonical example of big data. Storm is a real-time processing system that was built by Twitter. Redis is an in-memory database that we can use to aggregate the views from Hadoop and Storm and present it to a Node.js application or any front end. If we dig a little bit in more into this, it's actually not as easy as five steps. Kafka relies on Zookeeper to run so it's two services. Hadoop doesn't mean anything if you only have one box. So we're going to scale that up a little bit and have four nodes, four compute nodes, and uh, one master node. Storm also is a distributed system, so you need to scale it a little. So we're going to also have five nodes, one of which is a master node. And then Redis, Node.js, HAProxy, we don't have to scale immediately, but those are workloads that can scale as well. 
Now, if you have to start from scratch with this, you've got eight technologies, at least 15 VMs to start, and more than 2,000 pages of documentation. So in your opinion, how long is that gonna take before you get a first client set up or first set of analytics on tweets? So would, that, would you see it's six months, three, one, 15 minutes? Okay, so you do that in 15 minutes? You don't? Oh, come on. <laughs> Actually, it's 14, and that includes deployment, okay? Why is that? It's because when you design something with Juju, you can save that workload and redeploy it. So you can spend time designing things, but then you can share it and you can, you can deploy it on, on any cloud, including bare metal. So we're gonna do that, actually, together. This is jujuchamps.com where you can test uh, workloads and you can, uh, it doesn't actually deploy things, but you can uh, look at what it would look like. So I'm gonna import the bundle, which is sentiment analysis. Okay, we deploy it. So you could do that on any cloud, on OpenStack, on bare metal. You can also do that if you have a powerful enough computer locally on containers. So this is what it looks like. As it takes a lot of time, and I don't have that time, I did that for you on Amazon. So you can see it looks exactly the same, okay? And this is live, it's running. I can go to the Storm UI, can refresh that page, and I can see that it's processing things. So that says that over the last 10 minutes, it processes 200 tweets. Now this is my dashboard. I'm gonna refresh that, so it's gonna get empty. Okay, and after some time, it's gonna load new tweets, and you can see that in that area here. Okay, it's coming in. So you can see a positive score, a negative score, and um, the text that was analyzed, which is the text of the tweet passed and where we removed all the words. Now eventually, you're gonna have to scale that. So it's fine to have something that works um, just for starters, but you want, Storm, you, you want more nodes in Storm, for example. So you can also hook that up to a monitoring system. So that's an example made with Zabbix, you could use Nagios, you can hook that to any monitoring system you have. You can deploy that monitoring system with Juju, or you can use your own existing infrastructure. Now I'm gonna go to Storm. I can see that I've got many nodes here. Oh, sorry, just one more stat. I've got more workers. I can see I've got four workers. If I go back to my Juju admin here, and I go to my workers, I can see I've got four working units. So from there, I can, I'm monitoring the load on the servers, and if I find out that one of them isn't actually working properly, or if I want to scale up because I've got more and more tweets, then I can just add the unit. I made that manually, but you could do that automatically. Now going back here, you can see I've got a fifth unit starting here. So you have a scalable, scale-out workload you deploy on the cloud or at home, then you hook that to existing bits you have, and you can have auto-scaling automatically. So it answers an issue. You want to analyze tweets, you want to store them, you want to make from tweets valuable information, and you want that to last. That's an example of what you can do with Juju. Thank you. Any questions? Got time for a question? I think we're good. Thank you, Samuel. Welcome. Okay. So I'm switch. Yeah, I'm going to switch to my laptop.
Fantastic. My name is Dustin Kirkland. I work at Canonical. I'm a developer, product manager. Work on a number of things. This is my colleague Kapil. He too works on a number of things related to uh, Juju, Maz, OpenStack. Um, here we're going to talk about two very special workloads to us that we often find ourselves running on OpenStack, and that is Hadoop and Cloud Foundry. Now, for anyone who's been to an OpenStack summit before, uh, anyone who's certainly been here the last couple of days, you've probably seen us deploy OpenStack. Um, you've probably seen us deploy OpenStack on these orange boxes, which we're going to use in this demo, uh, perhaps on uh, some, some much bigger hardware, noisier hardware, uh, data center caliber hardware, such as these uh, AMD C micros. Um, and we've done that using a tool that's very special to us. But is that all that you've seen? Have you seen Juju deploy Hadoop and scale Hadoop yet? It looks something like this, which looks remarkably like this, right? Lots of components, disparate components, connected, some tightly bound, some loosely bound, some replicated, um, a bunch of common services. Uh, this is what a small subset of the Hadoop ecosystem looks like. You've got, of course, the Hadoop master and the slaves, uh, but you've also got Accumulo and, and Yarn and Pig and Hive and MySQL and Spark and HBase. This is, a, uh, this is a really interesting collection of big data technologies, and this is what it takes to actually do uh, some of the hard work that, that Samuel just showed us in his bundle, the sentiment analysis involved you know, multiple components of, of technology. But it doesn't stop there. We can use that same tool to deploy Cloud Foundry, which is our next most interesting, uh, our most interesting workload that we can deploy. Um, and Cloud Foundry, much like what you saw just now with Hadoop, and much like what you just saw with OpenStack, involves, what's that, 17, I think we count it, 17 separate services that all have to work together to, to provide a platform as a service, to provide the best platform as a service you're going to find in open source today. Um, you know, and some of these components uh, seem a little bit similar. You've got a, 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 um, uh, a log, logging mechanism. You've got etcd. You've got MySQL. You've got an HA proxy. You've got a cloud controller and so forth. All of these pieces have to be up and running and connected to other pieces. You can see that the, the the cloud controller over here on the sort of your lower right connected to almost every other piece in the entire infrastructure. That's, that's part of what <coughs> cloud controller needs to do. It needs to have those connections associated with everything. And that is, that is fundamentally a difficult problem to solve and something that we've done for you with Juju and with the charms that Juju deploys. That's Juju. That's the power of Juju. And we're talking about three of the world's most complicated workloads today, all deployed by a single tool. All deployed by a single tool. And what's important about that, and what, why we're so passionate about this, and why we're so interested in sharing this with, with all of you, is that it's, it is one piece of technology with very reusable components. You'll see MySQL is used in all three of those, those, those deployments. And, MySQL is fundamental to OpenStack. It's fundamental to what this workload is doing with Hadoop, and it's fundamental to what's happening with, with Cloud Foundry. That MySQL charm is the exact same code and logic and expertise that has been baked into that, that one bit of code that we call a charm. Um, and it, it contains everything that's necessary for that MySQL to operate in any environment where MySQL service is required. And the same goes for the rest of those pieces, the common pieces, especially the common pieces, the MySQLs, uh, along with the Rabbit and the etcd and, and, and so forth. So that's three really complex workloads that can be deployed to three very important places, public clouds, private clouds, and bare metal. Now, Juju supports a number of public clouds, including AWS, um, as well as Azure, uh, Google Compute Engine, uh, Joyent. Uh, what else am I missing here? Azure. Az Azure. Um, and we're adding more. Uh, these are Canonical's public cloud partners. 
Um, any charm that can be deployed can be deployed to a public cloud. In fact, you see OpenStack being deployed to a public cloud here. Where would that make sense? Certainly in, in our, our testing and our regression testing, uh, we can actually gate our, our commits on deploying an OpenStack to AWS for the sake of ensuring that those services come up and, and work well together. That's actually where we do some of our IPv6 testing, is actually deploying OpenStack into an environment such as, such as a, a public cloud. It also can be deployed to bare metal, and that's the piece that hopefully you've seen a couple of times today. But it's not just, it's not just OpenStack. We can do the exact same thing with Hadoop and Cloud Foundry. We can deploy Hadoop to public clouds, private clouds, and to bare metal. We can deploy uh, Cloud Foundry to public clouds, private clouds, and bare metal. But for the sake of today's talk, we're really interested in two specific workloads. That's Hadoop and that's Cloud Foundry, and we're interested in one place. That's deploying it to OpenStack, to a private cloud. So we're going to start off with a Cloud Foundry demo, um, and I'm going to turn it over to Kapil uh, to do that for us. All right, Kapil. Thank you. So I'm going to assume that most of you know what Cloud Foundry is. Um, and if you don't, the quick intro is that it is a uh, it is a enterprise pass for simplifying operations and deployment uh, in a uniform way across an organization um, to allow for rapid application delivery. Um, I've got here a, a sample application uh, written in Node.js. Um, I've pointed it, it's a simple app that just looks at a GitHub repo and will calculate the number of the, the most valuable contributors in a 80s ASCII arcade style game. And I can reload it, and it's running across on OpenStack. And here, oops, here is that Cloud Foundry. Um, and if I go to, so we've got three levels of inception here. L let me interrupt you just for Kay. one second. When Kapil says it's running on OpenStack, it's actually running on, on these two boxes. He's running Cloud Foundry on this box, and we're going to look at Hadoop in a minute on this box. And by on this box, I mean we're running an OpenStack on 10 nodes, and then Cloud Foundry on top of those 10 nodes of, of OpenStack. Sorry. Just sure. wanted to link your eyes up to what's going on right here on, on stage. So earlier today, I was running a uh, benchmark on this high scores app, um, just doing uh, the equivalent of a Apache benchmark uh, on it. And uh, I ended up running into this little problem. My, my cloud was uh, overtaxed, and uh, I needed to add some more capacity to it. So what did I do? I went over to my mass, which had my inventory of nodes, and saw that I had two additional nodes that I could use. And then I went over to the Juju admin. Oops, not that one, that one. And I went to Nova Compute, and I added more units. Um, I happen to have these other pages cached, just so it takes a little bit of time to show it actually going out. Um, so what I, but effectively what I did was I just came here, added more units, and now we've got all 10 lights on that orange box deployed running as compute nodes. And we're going through three level layers of scaling and inception here. We're doing OpenStack, adding more compute nodes. We're going to Cloud Foundry to add more DEA uh, application worker nodes. And then we're going to the application itself to scale out the application, to tell Cloud Foundry that we want to run multiple instances of that application. Um, and that looks a bit... like this, for those who haven't seen it. Um, and now we'll kick off our little benchmark, which is just using a HTTP perf to hit it a little bit. Um, and I've actually got a separate instance of this running just because it takes a little while to add the DEA nodes, but I'll go ahead and do that here just to kick it off. 
Um, the DEA nodes are sort of the central component of Cloud Foundry that runs the application uh, containers and scales them out. If I can make it out. Left where? side. Left, right Thank there. you. So I'm going to go ahead and add three more DEA nodes and commit that change. And so now I've scaled out OpenStack, I've scaled out Cloud Foundry, and I've scaled up the, the app underneath. Now technically, uh, or on top, technically I would wait till the DA nodes were added to, so that Cloud Foundry will automatically load balance the application instances across all the DA workers. Um, in a separate view, we have a, another charm here that does an administrative view on Cloud Foundry. Um, this is an open source application from IBM that just gives sort of a, a administrative view into Cloud Foundry, allows you to see what all the application components are, um, how they're doing, what apps are running, you know, and what the overall, how many organizations there are, all the sort of internal management details of Cloud Foundry itself. So, with that note, I'm gonna go ahead and kick it, up, kick it back to Dustin to look at Hadoop. Cool, thanks Kapil. Um, yeah, so let's take a look at a Hadoop demo, which uh, I'm sorry, but is going to look a whole lot like the Cloud Foundry demo in terms of the steps that, that we're going to, to do. But hopefully that drives home the point how reusable this is. So this is our current Hadoop. We've currently got um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven instances of, uh, of slaves in a Hadoop cluster. Um, now let's say I want some more. So the first thing I might do is go and check my capacity in uh, my OpenStack uh, Horizon dashboard, and I'll see that, uh, wow, that, that pie chart on the left is almost full. I've got 11 of 12 of my virtual CPUs are, are used. I've got a, a bit of space left as far as memory, but my disk is actually starting to get, uh, uh, my, my disk usage is, is sort of creeping up, and that's one of the important aspects of a good Hadoop cluster. Um, so then I'll say, you know what, I want to scale out my actual OpenStack cluster. Um, so I'll next go to Maz and see if I have any available uh, machines. And in fact, if you look at node 7 and node 9, those nodes are, are off and ready. And you can see two blank spots in the orange box where we've got some spare capacity and that we can actually scale this up. So what we'll do is go to our Juju view of our Cloud Foundry deploy which, I'm uh, sorry, our OpenStack deploy, which looks like this. And I can see I currently have three units of Nova Compute deployed. And I'm going to take that, and I'm going to add that, add two to that. I'm going to add two new units to Nova Compute. I'm scaling up Nova Compute. I'm scaling up OpenStack. And I click Commit and Confirm. And very shortly, you'll start seeing the, the lights on. Um, somebody tell me when they start seeing lights come on on that, that far, uh, far right orange box there. Um, if we go back, actually, to our, our horizon, our, our UI, and instead of looking at the hypervisors, or got sorry, some. looking at the hypervisor side, we've got some lights coming on? Got some lights. Yes. This might actually work. Oh, I've got to log in again. Thank you for timing me out, horizon. I really didn't want someone logging into my laptop and messing up my demo. And we're going to do it again because it just wants to make really sure. OK, so we'll see. We currently have three Nova compute nodes, node 1, node 5, node 4. It doesn't really even matter where these are. All these machines are identical inside of here. Um, it, that, that part really doesn't matter. That's kind of the beauty of, of the, way the, uh, the way the cloud works, which is the way the orange box works. Um, what we, what we now should see inside of our Juju GUI, if I zoom in a little bit here and we really look at that Nova Compute, you'll see that we have two pending units. We have two units that are in the process of, of coming up. As soon as those come up, we'll then see additional hypervisors in our Nova Compute stack, at which point we can then go to another level of Juju, another environment where we've deployed Juju, and this is our Hadoop layer, OK? So we've got to build up from the bottom. We've got Maz at the very bottom taking care of the, the hardware, the physical hardware, the CPUs and the disks and, and the network, the physical machines. On top of that, we've got OpenStack, which is providing a virtualization layer that's, that's carving up 
those the, the physical machines that Maz gives OpenStack, OpenStack is carving that up into virtual compute units, right? Virtual storage, virtual networking, and so forth. And then we're actually running Hadoop in virtual machines on top of OpenStack, right? So you got that? You got Hadoop on the top, and then we've got OpenStack in the middle, and then Maz at, on, at the bottom. Um, Juju is, is talking to all of those, right? Juju's talked to Maz and deployed OpenStack. That's, the, that's, our, that's our big uh, OpenStack deployment right here where you can see all the pieces of OpenStack, right? Um, but we've got yet another instance running inside of OpenStack. So if I click on our Instances tab, this instance down here, our jump server, is actually another Juju bootstrap. That's another instance of Juju running inside of OpenStack as a, as a virtual machine that has then provisioned all of these other instances into OpenStack. So we're running all of these, do we have a count of instances? 10 instances. So we got 10 instances currently running in our OpenStack, and that's what is pegging our, our hypervisor uh, right now, or our, our, um, our resource utilization is pegged right now. So as soon as those units come online, we'll have more capacity, and then we can go into our, our Hadoop view and change this from seven units to something more than that. And we'll come back and do that in, in just a second. Let's give, let's give this a minute to, to finish doing what it's doing. Oh, let's take another look at Maz, where we saw we had these two nodes that were not utilized. If I refresh this page, we'll see both of those machines are being deployed. And do we have all lights on? Still got one light not, not coming on. All right, we'll look at that in a minute. Um, in the meantime, while this is doing its thing, um, I had a couple of questions in the hall about what, what, are, the, what are the orange boxes. Um, this is the most portable cloud I think you'll ever find. There are 10 physical servers inside of this. Each one corresponds to the lights on the, on the front of the box. There are five servers sitting uh, along uh, this heat sink and five on this heat sink. And that's right, these are heat sinks. So the CPU and the, the video card are nested against this block of aluminum right here. There's no fan on any of the servers. There's one fan on the back cooling the, the, the power supply, but that's it. Ten identical servers. Each of those ten servers has a, a four-way i5. So there's basically four CPUs on ten different servers in, in this box. Every one of those servers also has 16 gigs of RAM, 16 gigs of, of DDR3 laptop-style RAM. And every one of those servers has a 120 gigabyte SSD, really fast storage. And that's part of the reason why this box is so small and light, and we can do everything with, with literally these, uh, these uh, uh, fanless heat sinks. So in aggregate, those 10 servers, that's 40 cores, that's uh, 160 gigs of RAM, and that's 1.2 terabytes of solid state storage, all inside of a box that's probably as big as the last PC that you owned underneath your desk, right? Um, now, that's, that's certainly not impressive compared to you know, a proper data center box, but the beauty of this thing is that I've carried this to four continents in the last four months, um, and that is remarkable, um, that you can lug that cloud around and, and do what, what you will with it. Look at that, our Nova Compute has scaled up uh, in the time that it takes to describe uh, uh, the hardware inside of an orange box. So now we come over to our hypervisors tab and we refresh this. May need to give it just a minute for, those to, uh, for, for it to recognize that. Uh, we've got a number of relations that are going, going to happen. If we come over, we look at this, we can see we're setting up, this is Juju doing this work for us. Uh, it's setting up a bunch of relationships that has to happen. If you go back and you look at that, that Nova Compute tab, you can see all the things that Nova Compute has to talk to. It, of course, has to talk to the Nova Cloud Controller, um, but it also has to talk to Ceph, and it has to talk to Glance, and Rabbit, and MySQL, and then it's also got a shared NTP server. We want to keep the time straight on all of our compute units. Uh, we've got Celiometer. Um, and that is, these are all the different things that, you know, we would need to take care of if we manually added a bunch of Nova Compute. Well, let's see if we're done here. We refresh, and there we go. This has just happened live. We've added two new Compute nodes, Node 9 and Node 7, 
And now our, our pie charts have gone from you know, red and yellow back to, into the blue state. So we actually now have more capacity, physical capacity in our cloud, at which point we can come to our, our Hadoop cluster and add a couple of units. Let's add, let's add five units. We're going to confirm. And we're going to confirm. We're going to confirm. And now we're waiting to have 12 units of Hadoop. OK, so where is this happening? If you remember, you know, multiple levels of inception. It's like that fantastic movie, part of which, the best scene of which takes place right here in Paris, actually. Um, there's a, uh, so, so what's happening, we're now at the layer, not at the physical bare metal. We're at the layer above that, OK? We're at the OpenStack layer. OpenStack is now creating, is now creating virtual machines for us, right? This is a normal Nova, a provision of Nova, right? Give me a new virtual machine in Nova. Uh, give me a new instance in o Nova. And Juju is doing that for us right now in the, in the background. So if we come back over and we look at our instances, we had, what, 10 instances running before? And we now have 15 instances, right? We scaled up our, our Hadoop by five, right? So we had 15 instances of that. Now that's actually going to take, uh, that's gonna actually going to go a whole lot quicker than, uh, than the physical provisioning of the system. Although I will say being able to physically install an entire OS on a piece of hardware, install Nova, and add it to every single, uh, you know, every sing relate all of those services together within five minutes is, I, I think, still pretty impressive. Um, but what we should see here with, the, with, with Hadoop is this should happen even quicker because these are virtual machines that uh, don't have to go through a, an installation, a, a, whole, a whole provisioning system. Um, and so we'll just give this just another minute. Um, I'm told we have like one minute left. Let me take a question or two while we're waiting for this to complete. Yes, sir. <laughs> Fantastic question. It's, it, every block represents a service. There are 12 physical units hidden behind that service. And in fact, there's two different views to Juju. There's the services view, but you can also see what's happening on machines. So on this machine view, we can now see all the different assigned systems, the aspects of that system. All of these are 1 gigahertz, 2 giga RAM, 20 gig uh, backing disk. Uh, you can actually then create containers. And if you've seen a theme, if you've been to any of our talks today, containers, containers, containers. You can actually put a bunch of services into containers. In fact, if we go to, the, if we go to this view, which is a lot more interesting one, you only see one, ch one image here per, um, per service. But if I then click on the machine view, we should see something kind of interesting. We see a bunch of physical machines, but we see some co-located co services. Okay, we didn't have to give MySQL an entire system and Rabbit an entire system. We actually put Rabbit and MySQL both on the same system, which is a lot more efficient usage and something we really had to do to optimize a large complex service like Cloud Foundry, like Hadoop, like OpenStack to work on, on bare metal. Um, yes, sir. So we've decided in our YAML file how to, to co-locate those, those, those bits. So in our, in our YAML file, we can, I'll, I'll, I can show you that later. But uh, we've, we've said, you know what, it makes a lot of sense to put this and this on, the, on, these, on these systems. In fact, stay for the next talk. Uh, we have an entire session on our reference architecture, on, on the recommended architecture, what we've learned from the field, from customers, and so forth. So, Josh is coming up now. Josh is, uh, is joining us from Pivotal, where he's going to talk to us about Cloud Foundry. And I will get back to you on our scaled Hadoop here in a, in a minute. Awesome. Thanks, Dustin. Yep. Um, most of you know me already. I've been around in OpenStack for a long time. I moved over to Pivotal recently. I'm, I'm moving up the stack. Um, and I think I've got just a couple minutes. So I mostly wanted to focus on why you'd have Cloud Foundry at all. You know, in the sense of, hey, we can do all these amazing things just using something like Juju on top of OpenStack, so what's the point of having a PaaS? Um, Pivotal is not the only 
company who's uh, decided to focus on Cloud Foundry, where they're really the, the founders of it, um, but it does have a massive and growing ecosystem. And in fact, there's a lot of overlap between the OpenStack ecosystem and the Cloud Foundry ecosystem um, in terms of probably most of the large committers to OpenStack have, have joined and committed to Cloud Foundry in the last uh, year or so. Um, the reason there's this relationship between the IaaS layer and the PaaS layers, if you, uh, I stole this diagram. Um, there's, if you grab a copy of the slides, a link to the original authors is in the slides. But this pizza model of cloud, I think, is really useful. Uh, and it helps people understand why do we keep adding new layers of as a service on, on top of other layers. The, uh, you know, it's containers, 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 right? Except it's not. You put containers on top of operating systems, operating systems inside VMs, VMs on top of hypervisors, hypervisors on top of hosts. We're doing this for actually good reasons. Uh, you, you get different isolation and performance characteristics out of these different primitives, right? I generally tell our customers, uh, don't put containers on bare metal yet, please. Um, without getting super technical, although you guys have been really technical today, so I was expecting to have to stay very high level. If you have access to bus mastering, you can poison the firmware. If you poison the firmware, the next time that piece of hardware is rebooted, goodbye hardware. Um, and so far, today, there is nothing that protects you from that attack other than virtualization. Don't put containers on bare metal. Put them inside VMs. Um, which sort of brings us back to, you know, why PaaS? What, what are the benefits we're getting out of orchestrating at this level, right? So, uh, just going IaaS gives you a better SLA, it gives you flexibility, it gives you speed, it gives you availability. VMs are a lot more portable, it's a nice generic abstraction, there are these security boundaries. Going to PaaS gives you this insane time to market benefit. Uh, when you start looking at, hey, I just write my code and I can deploy it to dev, to staging, to test, to prod without ever making changes, all of the configuration is separate from the software. I have these built-in mobile and data services. Um, the, the, the agile development in DevOps actually exists at the PaaS layer. It's really hard to get all the way through DevOps just working with pure IaaS. And we see this all the time. We see, uh, you know, most of what I do for Pivotal is fly around and talk to people who've already stood up OpenStack environments, some of them two or three years ago. I was uh, in Asia with a customer who's got a very large Folsom deployment. Um, they didn't deploy it with Juju, so now they're not quite sure how to upgrade it. But uh, they're saying, look, you know, IaaS got us only so far. Uh, typically, folks say, hey, it, it gave us a 30% cost savings, which is huge, but we realized we can get another 50% cost savings out of going to PaaS. And the other piece is PaaS is not just for developers. The PaaS model for operators is amazing because this is the day two problem, right? Day one, I deployed the app. It's awesome. Everyone can show a demo of deploying app. Day two, I need to upgrade that app without turning it off. That's something that, that, you know, building in a CD, CI environment, you have to be able to go through day two. Um, I don't have a clock up here, so somebody's going to have to give me time fingers or something. Thank you. Two minutes. Um, you look at, you know, okay, what, it, what am I actually doing when I'm interacting with this PaaS? I'm pushing these apps. I'm scaling these apps. I'm trusting the platform to deal with HA, right? And again, Cloud Foundry has HA at four separate levels, so it deals with HA. Uh, by using multiple data centers, m multiple OpenStack clouds, or AWS clouds, or Azure clouds, or whatever. Then it deals above that, making sure that the VMs are managed. So VMs die, they get relaunched. It makes sure that the containers inside those VMs are managed. If the container goes away, it gets respawned or replaced somewhere else. And then inside the container, make sure the process is running. There's actually no point in having a VM stay up if the process inside it is hung or dead. So keeping track of your application as being this entire stack, you know, process inside container, inside VM, inside some cloud, and being able to abstract all of those layers with the appropriate tools, just, it, it's so powerful. Um, I don't want to belabor the point on, on Cloud Foundry, but, you know, aggregation of logs and aggregation of metric data and uh, just the, a standardized interface for roles and, uh, and spaces is just super, super effective. So I wanted to close this with this, this idea of Hadoop. Um, I helped a very large telco recently do benchmarking of Hadoop inside OpenStack versus Hadoop bare metal. Two months, 120 physical servers, <laughs> large boxes, four racks of gear. Uh, the final penalty, just for the folks to take this home, it's 11% slower. 
in terms of actual performance of Hadoop inside OpenStack compared to BML. If you do it right, it's 11% slower. It's about 1,000 times faster to manage and operate. You know, one person manage an entire data center worth of Hadoop if you're doing it with these kinds of tools. So if, you, if you're thinking about your data as just data, and you're not thinking about data and apps occurring in the same place, you're, you're creating a world of pain for yourself in the future. Go into this, same tools and processes for, for both environments. That's it. I'll take questions afterwards if we have time. Thanks. Thanks, mm -hmm. Josh. Appreciate it. Um, one quick refresh, because I think we may have gotten what we wanted to see out of our scale. We have now scaled up Hadoop, and we should go from having seven instances of our Hadoop cluster to 12, right here live. Thank you very much. We hope you'll stay for the next talk on uh, our OpenStack infrastructure by Mark Squared. Uh, oh, uh, Mark uh, Solo. Okay, cool. Thank you very much.